I want to discuss a question I know that's been pressing on many of your minds. We spoke to you last several years ago, and before I get started today, since many of you are wondering, I just wanted to get it out of the way. The answer is boxers. <laughs> now that, now I hope all of you feel better. Do you know what this might be? Does anybody know what that is? Yes. What is it? It's uh, people logging on to Google around the world. Wow, okay. I didn't really realize what it was when I first saw it, but this is what helped me see it. This is what we run at the office that actually runs real time. Here it's uh, slightly logged, but here you can see around the world how people are using Google. And every one of those rising dots uh, represents probably about 20, 30 searches or something like that. And they're labeled by color right now, uh, by, by language. So you can see here we are in the US and they're all coming up red. We're, there we are in Monterey, hopefully I can get it right. Uh, you can see that Japan is busy at night right there. Um, we have Tokyo coming in in Japanese. There's a lot of activity in China. There's a lot of activity in India. Um, there's some in the Middle East, the little pockets. And Europe, which is right now in the middle of the day, is going really strong with a whole wide variety of languages. Um, now you can also see, if I Turn this around here. Uh, oh, hopefully, I won't shake the world too much. Um, but you can also see there are places where there's not so much. Australia, because there just aren't very many people there. And uh, this is something that we should really work on, which is Africa, which is just a few trickles, uh, basically in South Africa and a few other urban cities. But basically, what we've noticed is these queries, uh, which come in at thousands per second, are available everywhere there is power. And pretty much everywhere there is power, there is the internet. And even in Antarctica, uh, well, at least this time of year, uh, we from time to time we'll see a query rising up. And if we had it plotted correctly, I think the International Space Station would have it too. Uh, two, two, sorry. Three? Yeah, this will shift it sadly. Uh, so this is, uh, some of, the, some of the challenge that we have here uh, is you can see that it's actually kind of hard to get the, um, there we go. This is how we have to move the bits around to actually get the people the answers to their questions. You can see that um, there's a lot of data running around. Uh, it has to go all over the world through fibers, uh, through satellites, through all kinds of connections. And uh, it's, it's pretty tricky for us to maintain uh, the latencies as low as we try to. Hopefully your experience is good. But you can see also once again, so some places are much more wired than others. And you can see all the bandwidth across the US going up uh, over to Asia, Europe in the other direction, and so forth. Now what I would like to do is just to show you what one second of this activity would look like. And uh, if we can switch to the slides. All right, here we go. So this is slow down. This is what one second looks like. Uh, and, and this is what we spend a lot of our time doing, is just uh, making sure that we can keep up with this kind of traffic load. Now, each one of those queries has an interesting life and tale of its own. I mean, it could be somebody's health, it could be somebody's career, something important to them. Uh, and it could potentially be something as important as tomato sauce. <laughs> or... Uh, in this case, ketchup. So this is a, a query that we had. I guess it's a popular band that was more popular in some parts of the world than others. Anyway, you can see that it got started uh, right here in the US and Spain. It was popular at the same time, but it didn't have quite the same pickup in the US as it did in Spain. And then from Spain it went to Italy, and then Germany got excited, and maybe right now uh, the UK is enjoying it. And I guess so. I guess the US finally, finally started to like it too. And I just want to play it for it. 
Anyway, you can all enjoy it for yourself, so hopefully that search will work. Uh, as a part of, you know, part of what we want to do to, to grow our company is to have more searches. And what that means is we want to have uh, more people who are uh, healthy and uh, educated, uh, more animals if they start doing searches as well. Um, but uh, partly we wanted to, we want to make the world a better place. And so one thing that we're embarking upon is the Google Foundation. Uh, and we're in the process of setting that up. We also have a program already called Google Grants that now serves over 150 different charities around the world. And these are some of the charities that are on there. And it's something I'm very excited to be uh, a part of. Uh, in fact, many of the organizations that are here, the Acumen Fund, uh, I think Aprotech we have running, I'm not sure if that one's up yet. Um, and many of the people who have presented here are running through Google Grants. Uh, they run Google Ads, uh, and, and we just give them the ad credit so they can uh, let organizations know. Um, one of the earlier results that we got, uh, we have a, a Singaporean businessman who is now sponsoring a village of 25 Vietnamese girls for their education, um, and that was one of the earliest results. And as I said, now there have been many, many stories that have come in uh, because we do have hundreds of charities in there, and the Google Foundation will be an even broader endeavor. Now, does anybody know who this is? <laughs> <laughs> Aha! Orchid. Yes, somebody got it. This is Orchid. Is anybody here on Orchid? Do we have any? Oh, okay, okay. Not very many people know about it. I'll explain in a second. Um, this is one of our engineers. We find that they work better when they're submerged and covered with leaves. <laughs> That's how we turn those products out. Orchid had a vision to create a social network. I know all of you are thinking, yet another social network. But uh, it was a dream of his, and we basically, when people really want to do something, Google, well, we generally let them. So this is what he built. Uh, we just uh, released it in a test phase last month, and uh, it's been taking off. This is our VP of engineering. You can see the red hair, and uh, he's, I don't know if you can see the nose ring there. Uh, and these are all of his friends. Uh, so this is, uh, this is how we, we just deployed it, and it's, we just decided that people would send each other invitations to get into the service. And so we just had the people in our company initially send them out. And uh, now we've grown to over 100,000 members. Um, and they spread, actually, very quickly, even outside the US. You can see, even though the US is still the majority here, um, though, by the way, search-wise, it's only about 30% of our traffic. Um, but it's already going to Japan and uh, the UK and Europe and all the rest of the countries. So it's a fun little project. Um, there are a variety of demographics. I won't bore you with these. But it's just the kind of thing that we just try out for fun and see where it goes. Uh, and, well, I'll leave you in suspense. There, you can explain this one. Thank you, Sergey. So one of the things, uh, both Sergey and I went to Montessori school. And uh, I think, uh, for some reason, this, is, uh, this has been incorporated in Google. And uh, Sergey mentioned Orkut, which was something that you know, Orkut wanted to do uh, in, his, in his time. And we call this at Google, we've uh, embodied this as the 20% time. And the idea is for 20% of your time, if you're working at Google, you can do what you think is the best thing to do. And, uh, many, many things at Google have come out of that, such as Orkut and also uh, Google News. And I think uh, we sh many other things in the world also have come out of this. Mendel, who was supposed to be teaching high school students, actually you know, discovered the laws of genetics um, in, as a hobby, basically. <laughs> and so many, many useful things come out of this. Um, and News, which I just mentioned, uh, was uh, started by a researcher, and he just he, after 9-11, he got really interested in the news, and he said, why don't I uh, look at the news better? And so he started clustering it by category, and then he started using it, and then his friends started using it. And then, besides just looking cute on a baby's bottom, we uh, made it a Googleette, which uh, is basically a small project at Google. So it would be like three people or something like that. And, <coughs> they would try to make a product. And we wouldn't really be sure if it's going to work or not. And uh, in News's case, you know, they had a couple of people working on it for a while. And then more and more people started using it. And then we put it out on the internet. And more and more people started using it. And now it's a real full-blown project with more people in it. 
And this is how we keep our innovation running. I think usually as companies get bigger, they find it really hard to have small innovative projects. And we had this problem too for a while and we said, oh, we really need a new concept, you know, the Google Ads. That's a small project that we're not quite sure if it's gonna work or not, but we hope it will. And if we do enough of them, uh, some of them will really work and turn out such as news. But then we had a, we had a problem because then we had uh, over 100 projects. And I don't know about all of you, but I have trouble keeping 100 things in my head at once. And we found that if we just wrote all of them down uh, and ordered them, and these are kind of made up, and, uh, don't really pay attention to them. For example, the, the Buy Iceland was from a media article. We would never do such a crazy thing. But um, <laughs> in any case, um, we found if we just basically wrote them all down and ordered them, that uh, most people would actually agree what the ordering should be. And this was kind of a surprise to me, but we found that as long as you keep the 100 things in your head, which you did by writing them down, that you could do a pretty good job deciding what to do and where to put your resources. And so that's basically what we've done uh, since we instituted that a few years ago. And I think it has really allowed us to be innovative and still stay reasonably well organized. Um, the other thing we discovered is that people like to work on things that are important. And so naturally, people sort of migrate to the things that, that are high priorities. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that, that are uh, new or you might not know about. And uh, the top thing actually is the desk bar. And so this is a new, it's like if you use, how many of you use the Google toolbar? Raise your hands. Uh, how many of you use the desk bar? All right, see, you guys should try it out. Um, but if you go to uh, our site and search for desk bar, you'll get this. And the idea is instead of a toolbar, it's just present all the time on your screen on the bottom. And you could do searches really easily. And it's sort of like a better version of the toolbar. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is another example of a project that somebody at Google was really passionate about, and they just they got going, and it's really, really a great product and really taking off. Google Answers is something uh, we started, which is really cool, which lets you, uh, for 5 to to $100, you can uh, type a question in, and then there's a pool of researchers that go out and research it for you, and it's guaranteed and all that. And you can get actually very good answers to things without spending all that time yourself. Frugal lets you search shopping information, and Blogger lets you publish things. But all of these, well, these were all sort of innovative things that we did that, you know, we try many, many different things in our company. We also like to innovate in our physical space. and. We, uh, we noticed in meetings, you know, you have to wait a long time for projectors to turn on and off, and they're noisy, so people shut them off. And we, were, we didn't like that, so we actually, in a, maybe a couple of weeks, we built these little enclosures uh, that enclose the projectors, and so we can leave them on all the time, and they're completely silent. And as a result, um, we were able to build some software that also lets us manage meetings. So when you walk into a meeting room now, it lists all the meetings that are happening, uh, you can very easily take notes and they just get emailed automatically to all the people that were present in the meeting. And as we become more of a global company, we find these things really affect us. You know, can we work effectively with people who aren't in the room and things like that. And simple things like this can really make a big difference. Um, we also have a lot of engineers um, <laughs> in, in those meetings and they don't always uh, do their laundry as much as they should. Um, <laughs> And so we found it was pretty helpful to have uh, laundry machines for, for our younger employees especially. And uh, um, we also allow dogs and things like that. And we, we've had, a, I think, a really fun culture at our company, which helps people work and, and enjoy what they're doing. This is actually our cult picture. I just wanted to show quickly. Um, we had this on our website for a while, but we found that after we put it on our website, we didn't get any job applications anymore. <laughs> um, but anyway, we, every year we've taken the whole company on a ski trip. A lot of work happens in companies from people knowing each other and informally. And uh, I think we've done a, a good job encouraging that. It makes it a really fun, fun place to work, um, along with our logos too, which I think really embody our culture when we, when we change things. In the early days, we were actually advised we should never change our logo because um, we should establish our brand, you know, um, because, you know, you'd never want to change your logo. You want it to be consistent. And we said, well, that doesn't sound so much fun. Why don't we try changing it every day? <laughs> 
One of the things that really excites me about what we're doing now is we have this thing called AdSense. And uh, this is a, a little bit of foreshadowing. This is uh, from before Dean dropped out. But the idea is like on a newspaper, for example, we show you um, relevant ads. And this is hard to read, but it says Battle for New Hampshire, Howard Dean for President, uh, articles on Howard Dean. And these ads are generated automatically, like in this case on the Washington Post, from the content to the site. And so um, we use our over 150,000 advertisers and millions of advertisements. So we pick the one that's most relevant to what you're actually looking at, much as we do on search. So the idea is we can make uh, advertising useful, not just annoying, right? And uh, the nice thing about this, we have a self-serve program, and many thousands of websites have signed up. And this lets them really make money. And I, you know, there's a number of people I met. Uh, I met this guy who runs a cons conservation site at a party. And he said, you know, I wasn't making any money. I just put this thing on my site, and I'm making $10,000 a month. And, you know, thank you. I don't have to do my other job now. And I think uh, this is really important for us because it makes the internet work better. It makes content get better. It makes searching work better when people can really make their livelihood from producing great content. So this session is supposed to be about the future. Uh, so I thought I'd talk at least briefly about it. And the idea behind this is to do the perfect job doing search, you really have to be smart because you can type you know, any kind of thing into Google and you expect an answer back, right? But finding things is tricky and so you really want intelligence and in fact, the ultimate search engine would be smart. It would be artificial intelligence and so that's something we work on and we even have some people who are excited enough and crazy enough to work on it now and that's really their goal. So we always hope that Google will be smart, but we're always surprised when other people think that it is. And so I just wanted to give a funny example of this. This is a, a blog from Iraq, and it's not really what I'm going to talk about, but I just wanted to show you an example. Maybe, Sergey, you can highlight this. So we decided... <laughs> uh, we did, uh, actually, uh, highlight it right there. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, related searches right there. Uh, you can't see it that well, but we decided we should put in this feature into our AdSense ads called related searches. And so we'd say, you know, did you mean to search for, uh, what is this in this case, Saddam Hussein, because this blog is about Iraq, and uh, you know, in addition to the ads. And we thought this would be a great idea. And so um, there was this blog of a young, a young person who was kind of depressed. And he said, you know, I'm sleeping a lot. He was just kind of writing about his life. And um, our algorithms, not a person, of course, but our algorithms, our computers, you know, read his blog and decided that the related search was, I'm bored. And he read this, and he thought a person had decided that he was boring. <laughs> and uh, it was very unfortunate. And he said, you know, what are these you know, bastards at Google doing? Why don't they like my blog? And so then. We read his blog, which was getting, you know, sort of going from, from bad to worse. And we said the related search was retards. <laughs> and then, you know, he got even more mad and he wrote, like, started swearing and so on. And uh, then we produced You Suck. And finally, it ended with Kiss My Ass. <laughs> and so basically, he thought he was dealing with something smart. And of course, you know, we just sort of wrote this program and we, we tried it out and it you know, didn't quite work, and we don't have this feature anymore. <laughs> so that maybe I can switch back to the world. I wanted to end just by saying that there's a couple things that really make me excited to be involved with Google. And one of those is that uh, we're able to make money uh, largely through advertising. And one of the benefits that I didn't expect from that was that we're able to serve everyone in the world without worrying about, you know, places that don't have as much money. Um, so we don't have to worry about our products uh, being sold, for example, for less money in places that are poor, and then they get re-imported into the U.S., or, or for example, with the drug industry. And I think we're really lucky to have that kind of business model because everyone in the world has access to our search. And I think that's a tremendous, tremendous benefit. The other thing I wanted to mention just briefly is that we have a tremendous... Uh, ability uh, and, and responsibility to provide people the right information. And we view ourselves like a newspaper or a magazine that we should provide very objective information. And so in our search results, we never accept payment for our search results, 
we accept payment for advertising and we market as such. And uh, that's unlike many of our competitors. And I think uh, decisions we're able to make like that have a tremendous impact on the world and it makes me really proud to be involved with Google. So thank you. Yeah.